One of the most common uh, and problematic complications of deficiency of vitamin D in childhood is rickets. And this is a common disease uh, both in the developing and in the industrialized world. Uh, however, it is uh, less common in the industrialized world because of uh, more knowledge of, uh, of rickets and uh, also because of vitamin D fortification in, uh, in a lot of our foods. So this uh, fits into our discussion of vitamins and minerals. Uh, rickets can be due to uh, vitamin D deficiency. Uh, it can also be due to calcium deficiency and also rarely due to uh, phosphate deficiency. Rickets is an impairment of bone mineralization prior to epiphyseal closure. So this is only going to happen in childhood. Once the growth plates are closed, uh, rickets won't develop. However, if you do have a deficiency of any of the said nutrients, you can develop osteomalacia as an adult or as an older teenager. Uh, the most common cause of rickets is vitamin D deficiency, again, because it doesn't really occur uh, naturally in that many foods, and so you have to get it by fortification, uh, synthetic fortification of foods or by an oral supplement. Um, and that said, it's going to be more common in the developing world because they don't have, uh, they don't have ready access to vitamin D fortified foods. There's various classes of causes, and that's going to uh, that's going to be reflected in the labs as well as uh, be reflected in the phys physiology of uh, how the rickets happens. So you can have a vitamin D deficiency, which is the most common cause, um, or you can have a vitamin D receptor mutation, which uh, is genital issue. You can also have a calcium deficiency, or you can have a phosphate deficiency, and it's the phosphate deficiencies that uh, make up a lot of the congenital causes of rickets. Manifestations of rickets are all going to be pretty much the same regardless of what the cause is and they're of course going to be most notably skeletal malformations and that's really the most problematic thing that happens in rickets and it can be uh, it can impair uh, the child's uh, growth and it can also lead to long-term damage. Uh, so when you usually, when you see rickets, the most obvious uh, appearance is going to be genovarum in a younger child, which is bow-leggedness, but it can also be genovalgum if it's an older child. Those things are not sp specific to rickets. They can, uh, they can happen in other things, uh, in other disease processes, but uh, those will uh, be probably the most prominent uh, symptom. Also, some other things uh, that occur due to skeletal issues include kyphoscoliosis, which is a uh, rotation, scoliosis, uh, of, the, uh, of the spine. Uh, you can also see pronounced lumbar lordosis, craniotabes, which is a soft skull, costochondral swelling, which is commonly referred to as the rachitic rosary or the rosary of rickets, Metaphyseal cupping, which is uh, a not really an inf inflammation, but uh, a uh, hyperplasia of the growth plate. And this is going to be something you'll particularly see in the wrist and in the ankles. And there will also be a tendency to fracture because of the po poor bone mineralization. And this will usually be a green stick fracture, which is a, a bending and breaking of the bone. There can also be dental problems, of course. Um, teeth are just like bone. Muscle weakness, and that's usually going to be due to a hypocalcemia. And then Harrison's groove is a is a more specific uh, a more specific sign of rickets, uh, and it, it's it's pretty uh, uh, it's not really discreet. It's pretty obvious. So uh, we'll look at that. The workup for rickets is going to be everything that you do for uh, a suspected vitamin D deficiency. So you want to get a metabolic profile. And of course, you want to include calcium, phosphate, and magnesium levels. Remember, magnesium can alter and affect your uh, all the other. Uh, it can affect all the other electrolytes. So you want to have a magnesium level for completion's sake. You also want to have urine electrolytes because the kidney can be the site uh, of the problem. And also, we want to look and see if there is a problem with excretion. We want to also look for our vitamin D levels. And this is going to include calcitriol, which is the active form of vitamin D, as well as the precursor to calcitriol, which is 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And we'll see that there uh, is a cause of rickets uh, 
that impairs the conversion of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to calcitriol. You want to have parathyroid hormone levels. You'll want to have a CBC, radiographs of any uh, affected bones or suspected affected bones, and then assess for other nutritional deficiencies because, as we know, children who are deficient in one mineral are often, or one mineral or vitamin can be deficient, are often deficient in another vitamin or mineral, particularly the B vitamins. So this is uh, kyphoscoliosis, looks just like your regular scoliosis. So this is very pronounced here. And here's a uh, radiograph. This is excessive lumbar lordosis. This is the rachitic rosary. So the rachitic rosary is just costochondral swelling. And they just look like little beads um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the chest. So here's another uh, a little bit more discreet example of rachitic rosary, and it gets its name for uh, the rosary, which is a prayer bead, uh, prayer beads that are used by Christians. I actually made this rosary myself, so I'm not trying to show off or anything. But this is what this is what a rosary looks like. So that's where it gets its name from. You can see that this looks like beads on the chest. This is a green stick fracture. Green stick green stick fractures happen in children because they have softer bones. And uh, this is a, a green stick fracture of both ulna and radius. And you can see that there's a bending and a breaking. And it gets its name from green stick. Here's another green stick fracture. I believe, I can't see the whole thing, but this looks like it's uh, the radius. So here you have metaphyseal cupping. And this is just uh, essentially like a swelling of uh, the growth plate. And this is what it would look like on the outside. And this is craniotabes, the soft skull. Note that this is not uh, at, uh, th this is uh, on the skull bone. So it's very soft. And, and the, the, the texture is going to be a lot like the fontanelles, but it's not going to be where the fontanelles are located. This is Harrison's groove. Harrison's groove is formed because uh, the ribs are soft. And when the ribs are soft and the, the, the child breathes in, there is a collapsing uh, down where the diaphragm uh, inserts. And so you get this, this line, and this is Harrison's groove. So here it is a lot more obvious in this child. You can also see the rachitic rosary here on this side, on the right side a little bit more. So our causes of rickets are vitamin D related, and this can be due to a nutritional vitamin D deficiency, and it can also be due to a secondary vitamin D deficiency, which is typically due to malabsorption, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, cystic fibrosis. There's also vitamin D dependent rickets, which are not due to vitamin D, uh, poor vitamin D intake, but rather uh, they're due to metabolic issues. There's also hypocalcemia-related rickets, which, as its name implies, is going to be due to uh, low calcium. And again, that can be due to poor intake of calcium, or it can be due to uh, a problem that, uh, that excretes too much calcium from the body. You're wasting calcium, and that's going to be your renal osteomalacia, in which you have chronic kidney disease. And then finally, there's hypophosphatemia-related rickets, and these are typically congenital in origin very difficult to not get enough phosphate in your diet because it's, it's everywhere. And this is a big problem for people with kidney disease. Their phosphate levels are typically really high, and that's why uh, patients with severe kidney disease need dialysis. Okay, so uh, on the USMLE, when you're asked questions about rickets, uh, it's probably going to be in the context of hypocalcemia, osteomalacia, or a vitamin D deficiency, either primary or secondary. Um, but because the USMLE really loves physiology, um, you may get asked about some of these other forms of, uh, of rickets, which are, uh, are less common, but they really test your knowledge of the physiology, and they'll give you the labs, and you'll have to deduce what the uh, physiology is uh, just from the labs and what the cause is. So get ready for a really hearty, healthy dose of physiology uh, in the upcoming slides here.
Vitamin D deficiency rickets is the most common cause of rickets worldwide, both in the U.S. and the uh, developing world. But you'll really see this in, in developing countries where vitamin D fortified foods are not really readily available. Uh, so in the U.S., uh, this will be often seen in children who are on, on unusual diets. Uh, a lot of times parents who are vegetarians or vegans uh, will push that diet on their children. And um, that's okay if there is sufficient supplementation of these vitamins and minerals um, that's given in addition. Uh, but the, the nutrient requirements of children are a lot different from the nutrient requirements of adults. And so while it may be okay for an adult to be on a vegan diet, when you're talking about a one or two year old child, if they're on a vegan diet and they're not supplemented, that can really be a problem. Also, picky eaters, really picky eaters, uh, they may not be getting their vitamin D. And then children who drink unfortified milk, uh, particularly soy milk. A lot of milk in the United States is fortified with vitamin D. And so when children are getting their milk, uh, they're also getting their vitamin D. You'll make your diagnosis based on uh, nutritional history, of course, radiographs are going to be important if there's any outward problems, and then lab findings are going to be absolutely essential. Your lab workup is going to be really important for not necessarily diagnosing the rickets, so that'll, uh, that'll be more apparent on your physical exam, but diagnosing the cause of rickets. And remember that vitamin D deficiency, primary vitamin D nutritional deficiency is the most common. Uh, also consider malabsorption. If the patient has an appropriate diet. Uh, the, the parent says, my kid is drinking vitamin D fortified milk, but they're presenting with rickets. Um, and also consider malabsorption if there's consistent symptoms present. And that would be things like uh, fat in the stool uh, and uh, other signs of malnutrition, such as failure to thrive and, uh, and uh, low, low weight. The lab findings in vitamin D deficiency is going, are going to be vitamin D levels. So 25-hydroxy vitamin D and calcitriol will both be low, and that reflects the uh, deficiency of vitamin D. Uh, serum calcium will be variable. Remember that when a person has uh, low vitamin D, that's going to cause low calcium. However, the way that we get around that is by increasing our parathyroid hormone, and that breaks down bone, demineralizes bone. And so the number one priority for your body is to have an appropriate calcium level, because if you don't have an appropriate calcium level, uh, particularly if you're hypocalcemic, but also if you're hypercalcemic, uh, you can die from that. So you have to maintain a, a good calcium level. And so even though these children are not absorbing calcium, uh, they will uh, demineralize their bone, and so you may see a, an appropriate serum calcium. Uh, serum phosphate, though, will be low, and that's because the parathyroid hormone will, uh, will um, encourage renal excretion of, uh, of phosphate. Then, of course, parathyroid hormone is going to be high, and uh, due to that high parathyroid hormone, you'll have uh, a high urine phosphate. And of course, you'll have a low urine calcium because the body is trying to, uh, is trying to conserve as much calcium as possible. So if you haven't yet looked at, um, at uh, the uh, vitamin D physiology, um, I, I addressed that uh, on the uh, lecture for vitamin D, and I would recommend that you watch that uh, because it's really going to be important to know that physiology in order to understand uh, these uh, various forms of rickets. The management is pretty simple. It's just vitamin D replacement. You don't necessarily need to use calcitriol here. You can just use regular old vitamin D and uh, these children should be able to uh, convert the vitamin D into calcitriol. If they can't, then uh, your, your diagnosis will switch to possibly a 1-hydroxylase enzyme deficiency, uh, which uh, can also cause uh, something that looks like vitamin D deficiency, but what the problem is going to be is that the child isn't making calcitriol. And then also, of course, parent and patient education. Usually this is parent education because these children are quite young, 
making sure that they're getting vitamin D supplementation with their diet. Vitamin D dependent rickets is that rickets I just referred to, which is, and this is type 1, there's two types, type 1 and type 2, uh, and this is caused by a 1-hydroxylase deficiency. So remember, 1-hydroxylase is that enzyme uh, in your kidneys that converts uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D to calcitriol or 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. Um, and it's calcitriol that's the active form. So if you cannot convert 25 hydroxy vitamin D into calcitriol, it's essentially like you have a vitamin D uh, deficiency because you don't have the active form of vitamin D. And so in this case, the presentation will be similar to a vitamin D deficiency, but here you have a child that is getting sufficient dietary vitamin D. So the parent is saying, my kid's drinking fortified milk, but you have a picture that looks like rickets. The major differential diagnosis here is going to be malabsorption. So your key to diagnosis in vitamin D dependent rickets type 1, the 1 hydroxylase deficiency, is a, uh, that, the, that the child has a 25 hydroxy vitamin D level that's normal or high and the cal uh, calcitriol levels are low and that's reflecting your metabolic break here. You're not converting the 25 hydroxy vitamin D uh, to calcitriol. Other labs will be consistent with vitamin D deficiency because your calcitriol is not working. Um, so you'll have similar lab profiles to vitamin D deficiency. Another differential diagnosis technically would be chronic kidney disease, but generally chronic kidney disease will be more obvious in, in, in the history. The management here is, of course, vitamin D replacement, but in this case we have to replace the vitamin D with the active uh, form of vitamin D, we need to directly replace their calcitriol because if you just give them regular old vitamin D, they're not going to be able to convert that to calcitriol. Vitamin D dependent rickets type 2 is uh, much more severe and, and much more problematic. So this is caused by a deactivating mutation of the calcitriol receptor. And so again here you have appropriate intake of vitamin D, but now you can't respond to calcitriol even though you're making it. So these children will have high vitamin D levels, both the, uh, well, usually the 25-hydroxy vitamin D is converting, so that'll be normal, but uh, they'll, have, they'll have very high calcitriol levels. Uh, they're going to be making lots of parathyroid hormone because um, they're not reacting to vitamin D, they're not getting calcium in, and uh, therefore their parathyroid hormone levels are high, they're activating uh, these enzymes, particularly 25-hydroxy vitamin D, 125, uh, sorry, 25-hydroxylase, 1-hydroxylase. Uh, and so they're converting the vitamin D, but they're not responding to it. And so the calcitriol levels will be high. This is an autosomal recessive disease, so definitely look for a family history. And it usually presents really early on in infancy. You can see alopecia that presents with severe cases, and that just reflects the severe nature of their, uh, of their, uh, of their vitamin D deficiency. Symptoms of vitamin D deficiency, of course, will be present, and this is despite the fact that the child is getting sufficient dietary vitamin D. So again here, your labs are going to be important. You're going to be able to differentiate this based on the fact that here, the child has high levels of calcitriol, versus if you have a 1-hydroxylase deficiency, it's going to be low levels of calcitriol. But other labs are going to be consistent with vitamin D deficiency. So high calcitriol, but labs consistent with calcitriol deficiency, definitely look for deactivating mutation of the calcitriol receptor, or VDDR type 2. The management here is much, much more difficult because how do you treat something that's endogenous to the body? particularly a receptor deficiency. The best way to treat this, really the only way available to treat this, is to try to just saturate uh, the normal receptors because usually what we think is that these children have uh, some level of normal receptors, but uh, most of their receptors are deficient, and so we just try to saturate as many of, of, of their receptors as possible. So we give mega doses of calcitriol, and then we also replace, uh, we, we also give them uh, 
extra calcium to uh, try to uh, get them to absorb as much of that calcium as possible. But not all children will respond, and so a lot of times you're just going to have to treat this uh, uh, just symptomatically. Renal osteomalacia is uh, going to be rickets that's superimposed on chronic kidney disease, and so this will be a little bit easier to diagnose in the fact that you've got a child that you generally already know uh, has chronic kidney disease. And chronic kidney disease results in two problems, and both of these problems will predispose a child to rickets. So first of all, you're going to have a 1-hydroxylase deficiency because this is produced in the kidney, and that's going to reduce the production of calcitriol. And then also, because the kidney is not functioning, you're going to have a tubular reabsorption uh, problem, and uh, you're, not, you're not going to be able to uh, re reabsorb calcium, and so you're going to have calcium wasting. And so because both you have a calcium deficiency and uh, an inability or uh, an impairment of producing calcitriol, both of these things are going to contribute to, uh, to rickets. Apart from the signs of bone disease, the child will have a history of renal failure, and that's going to be your real hint here. Uh, as far as labs, your calcitriol levels will be low. Uh, however, the 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D levels will uh, be appropriate, and this reflects the 1-hydroxylase deficiency. So that looks like a VDDR type 1, but there's going to be a few extra things here, and uh, Primarily what that's going to be is a high phosphate level, and that's due to the inability to excrete phosphate. Uh, and then uh, another obvious clue is going to be an elevated serum creatinine. The management here is calcitriol replacement. Uh, that will uh, get you by your 1-hydroxylase deficiency. And then you want these children on a low phosphate diet uh, and or phosphate binders, and that's pretty much what you're going to do for uh, anybody with chronic kidney disease. Uh, and that's going to help uh, not only because you want to keep the serum phosphate levels low in general, but it'll also reduce the production of PTH, which encourages uh, the reabsorption of phosphate. Hypocalcemic rickets typically manifests in children who are breastfeeding and not getting calcium supplementation or in children who are consuming unfortified formulas. This can coexist with a dietary vitamin D deficiency and often does coexist with a vitamin D deficiency, but I wouldn't expect the USMLE to put both of those together just because uh, it's difficult to ask a question, a multiple choice question on that. Uh, however, for step three, uh, you'll definitely want to look for a vitamin D deficiency when you do your workup, uh, because if there is a vitamin D deficiency, you'll want to uh, manage that as well, in addition to the calcium uh, supplementation. Uh, this can also be due to malabsorption of calcium, which is typically going to be how you're going to see a calcium slash vitamin D deficiency uh, together. And that can occur with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's, or uh, celiac disease, a beta lipoproteinemia, small bowel resection, pretty much any disease that affects the small bowel. In isolated calcium deficiency, you're going to see low calcium levels, but uh, you're going to see both a low serum calcium and a low urinary calcium because you're trying to preserve as much calcium as possible. Uh, the urine phosphate will be high due to the elevated parathyroid hormone. And this can look somewhat similar to, uh, to uh, the uh, chronic kidney disease, but it's much more obvious that this is uh, not chronic kidney disease because these children have normal renal function. Um, and uh, and, and uh, so your history will, will show you that. And if you really need to know, just get a creatinine level. Uh, management is going to include adequate calcium supplementation, and if there is malabsorption, you'll probably give these kids vitamin D. Uh, just base it on your labs. If there's normal vitamin D, you probably don't need to supplement these kids with vitamin D. If the vitamin D is low, then you can supplement vitamin D. There's various forms of congenital rickets. Uh, I would say the most commonly tested is the X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, or XLH, or XLHR. Uh, this is caused by an overproduction of fibro fibroblast growth factor 23, FGF23. And FGF23 is uh, what we know as a phosphantonin, and so it's something that reduces the phosphate level. Uh, 
and it reduces the phosphate level by, uh, by encouraging the kidney to, uh, to excrete phosphate. Uh, so uh, it, it also uh, inhibits one, two ways is this contributing to phosphate or to uh, rickets. Uh, you can get rickets uh, by having low phosphate levels, but remember that it's very difficult to have low phosphate just based on diet alone, so there's usually something behind that. Um, and so the, the low phosphate level uh, is going to be due to elevated excretion rickets because you're, uh, you're, you're, you're not producing calcitriol. So lab-wise, you'll see a normal 25-hydroxy vitamin D, uh, but a low calcitriol, and that's indicating that metabolic break there, the, uh, the one hydroxylase deficiency. You'll also see a low serum phosphate due to the phosphate wasting in the kidney. And the management here is calcitriol, and that gets you beyond your 1-hydroxylase deficiency, and then phosphate supplementation, which gets you beyond your low serum phosphate. You've got to treat both of those because both of these problems contribute to rickets. Autosomal dominant hereditary rickets, and remember also, this is X-linked, so you should see a family uh, a, a family issue. So you'll see uh, it's in usually going to be in little boys, and you look at the mother's history, maybe her brothers or her father uh, were affected with the same thing. Uh, autosomal dominant hereditary rickets and autosomal recessive hereditary rickets essentially is the same thing as X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Um, it's due to an overproduction of FGF23. It's just transmitted in an, in an autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive uh, manner. Uh, so uh, this would be what you would suspect if you saw this in a girl, but you could see this also in a boy. It really is just differentiated based on the, uh, the transmission history and probably of the uh, exact mutation, but that I'm not sure of. Hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria has a, uh, a very unique profile. Uh, this is not very common in the U.S. It's not really common overall, but where you do tend to see this is in the Middle East. So this is due to a defect of sodium phosphate co-transporter in the proximal tubule. And so what you wind up with here is a wasting of phosphate. And so the hypophosphatemia is going to stimulate PTH production, and uh, the serum calcium, therefore, is going to be high, and the serum phosphate is low. But remember, you need both calcium and phosphate to mineralize bone. Remember, we're making calcium hydroxyapatite, and that requires both calcium and phosphate. So it's that low phosphate that's contributing to the rickets. Uh, because you uh, have a uh, problem with, uh, with your kidneys here, um, you're going to have uh, a high phosphate because your, your sodium phosphate co-transporter is not working, so that phosphate is going to be excreted through the kidneys. And because your serum calcium is so high, you'll also have a high urinary calcium because your kidneys are trying to get rid of that as much as possible. Because remember, a high calcium, hypercalcemia, can be deadly, so the kidneys are trying to get rid of that as, as quickly as you're, you're getting it in. The management here is pretty simple. It's a phosphate supplementation. And what that will do, if you get enough, have enough phosphate, in, uh, if you're taking in enough phosphate, um, that will, that will uh, normalize the phosphate levels. And as the phosphate levels are normal, the PTH production will normalize. And as the PTH normalizes, uh, it will, uh, it will uh, normalize the uh, kidney functions. Uh, so then you should have normal calcium, normal phosphate. Uh, and so the way you're going to follow this is by uh, giving the child phosphate supplementation and following their PTH levels. You'll want that to normalize. Other diseases that can cause hypophosphatemia, and we're not going to talk about these because these are not just rickets diseases. These fall under other problems. Uh, include uh, tumor-induced osteomalacia. These children will have tumors elsewhere. Uh, these all look like X-linked uh, hereditary rickets. Okay, all of these things cause high fibro fibroblast growth factor 23 or uh, phosphatones. So, uh, tumor-induced osteomalacia, McCune-Albright syndrome. Remember, this is uh, the uh, the syndrome that causes uh, overall uh, reduction in uh, in your hormones. 
uh, epidermal nevus syndrome, and then neurofibromatosis. So diagnose this based on uh, both on your uh, on your labs. It'll look like X-linked hereditary rickets, um, and then also uh, based on clinical appearance. Fanconi syndrome is a proximal tubular defect, and this uh, encourages wasting of uh, various uh, various um, uh, uh, components, uh, particularly phosphate, uh, but also bicarbonate. And because you're wasting bicarbonate, you can get metabolic acidosis, and metabolic acidosis also encourages bone demineralization. So. Uh, uh, look for that as well. And Fanconi syndrome is also, uh, in most cases, it's hereditary, but there are some cases where it's acquired. And then dense disease is extremely rare, but you can look it up on your own. I'm not going to go into that. I've never seen that tested on, on the USMLE. So here's our little recap here, and I highlighted in red uh, these, uh, or might look like pink or orange, uh, but uh, I, I highlighted the, uh, the lab findings that are very characteristic of uh, each of these diseases. So really, uh, what this is going to require you to do is know the physiology. Once you know the physiology, all you need to do is know what the underlying cause is. And by knowing the physiology, you'll, you, you should know uh, what labs will be disturbed.